right, well, good morning, church. All right, what a great opportunity we have today just to come into the house of the Lord and lift up the name of Jesus. And just by a hand clap of praise this morning, who all is going to help us do that? Amen. All right, thank you for that. If you will, let's stand together and let's get started this morning. We're going to sing about the great love of Jesus and the, uh, what he's done for us and how that once you're in his hands, that he will never, ever let you go. Amen. That's what this first song talks about. And if you know it, I pray that you'll sing along with us. Amen. Sing this with me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, won't I know you are near, and I will fear no evil, for my God is with me, and if my God is But until that day comes, we'll live to know you here on the earth. Yeah. I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I? Oh, no, you never let go Every high and every low Oh, no, you never let go Lord, you never let go of me Keep on running and you never let go Oh, and I can see the light That is coming from a heart that holds on And there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes, still I will praise you, still I will praise you. Oh, no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh, no, you never let go every high and Amen. Aren't you glad that once you're in his hand, that he will never, ever let you go. Amen. You know, we've all got something to be thankful for. And one of the things is, if you're alive in this room today, if you're watching us online, whether live or later, then you're still breathing. Amen. And God has a purpose for us because of that. That's what this song talks about, if you know it. Uh, if you will, sing along with us this morning. Oh. 
hold your heart, what stirs your soul, what matters come to mind. Cares you keep, the thoughts you think, it's not all wasted time. Seeking you will find Joy still comes in the morning Hope still walks with the hurting If you're still alive and breathing Praise the Lord Don't stop dancing and dreaming There's still good news worth repeating So lift your head and keep singing Praise the Lord We wonder why we lost our way from home. A father finds the child inside. We left for growing old. Awake, 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 my soul. Let everything praise the Lord In the working, in the waiting Let it praise the Lord In the blessing, in the breaking Come on and praise the Lord In the dying, in the rising Let it praise the Lord Praise the Still walks with the hurting. If you're still alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. Oh, still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing. Praise the Lord. Joy still comes in the morning. And hope still walks with the hurting. Alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. It's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing, praise the Give the Lord all the honor and glory he deserves as we lift him up and we praise him this morning. And church, you may be seated. say, well, why then are you in the baptistry? This is not holy water or magic water. It's just regular water. And a baptism is a picture of what Jesus has done in a new believer's life. A baptism is the first step of obedience. When you trust Jesus as your Savior, he's also your Lord. So that means we want to obey him. And so as I lower her in the water and raise her back up, it pictures that she was dead in her sins. And now she's alive to walk in newness of life. And so today, I want to introduce you to someone that was saved during vacation Bible school this past year. 
and her name is Sadie Brothers. Sadie, if you want to come down. Sadie, who is your Savior and your Lord? Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Well, upon that profession of faith, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very good, very good. And we have some family here. Will everybody wave if you're a family? Glad to have you guys with us. Glad to have you, absolutely. Praise God. God is so good. Miss Deborah, if you want to come at this time. starting a worship service with a baptism, especially of a young person. We had two last Sunday. That's just marvelous. Good morning. Good morning. Ooh, you're pretty loud, lively. Good. I'm glad to see that. I'm, I'm just tickled pink to see all of you here. Brother Drew said last week, if you were here, that we're all a miracle. A miracle that you're here. And for parents, it's a miracle if you get here, if you've got a hassle of kids to feed and dress and get in the car, I know. But I want to give a shout out to grandparents. How many grandparents do we have here today? Raise your hand. Ooh, a bunch of them. Good. Well, happy Grandparents Day. During the month of September, we collect a special offering for the Myers-Mallory State Missions Fund. And for those of you who don't know about it, the state missions provide a lot of services of which I've been a part of in a tangential way. One of the most, one, the most important ones that we see probably in the news is disaster relief. I know we have some people in here that have served on disaster relief teams. Is anybody here today that actually served? None? Yes? Yeah, hey, good. If you had your eyes and your ears open, I mean, we get tornadoes all the time lower along the coast hurricanes. Alabama sends teams to other states when there's a disaster. We're not limited to just the state of Alabama. And other states come here when we have massive disasters. I personally have been on the, not the receiving end specifically of Alabama Baptists, but I know what it's like to have no running water and no electricity for about a week after a hurricane devastated um, Biloxi. We were living in North Biloxi at the time. I can hardly fathom what it's like to have your life destroyed. So a lot of hands need to go into helping people up on their feet when a disaster hits. Any money you give goes to that. It also goes to college campus missions. Our college age kids right now, that's our future, that's our hope. I'm so happy to see these young people being baptized because that's our future. Your money also goes to supporting foreign missionaries. We've got over 400 that are Alabamians that serve in the foreign mission field. One of those, actually we, I've known several and my husband and I have personally supported several. One was a college student that we nurtured while we lived in Mobile and she served in China. And we learned very quickly what you can and cannot say or write because of everything that's being monitored. We have no idea what it's like to live in a foreign country that as a Christian you are constantly under threat and how careful you have to be with what you do and what you say. They need our prayers all the time. We even have in our extended family, a family of nine that served in Senegal, which is a Muslim country, for over 15 years. Um, I can't even fathom what that's like um, to be there that long, but they were dedicated. People called the missions are truly dedicated. And one of the most dedicated that we've ever known personally was Dr. Myers, for which this offering is named Martha Myers. My husband and I actually worked with her. My husband was good friends with her when she was doing her internship and residency in Mobile. She did multiple residencies so she could be as 
prepared as she possibly could be as a physician. She worked for 25 years in Yemen and loved the people dearly. But it was an ISIS soldier who killed her and two others in the hospital there because they were Christians, but her specifically because he had been kind to his wife. It's hard to be a Christian in a foreign country. They need our prayers all the time. On the table outside this room, on the brown table, there are prayer guides. I encourage you to pick one up because it cites individuals in service in a variety of areas and gives you a person to pray for. I'm asking you if you would give generously as God lays on your heart. Our goal this year is $1,200, which was the same as last year. But we raised over $3,000 last year. So isn't that marvelous? You can give by scanning the uh, QR code and clicking on missions. You can write a check or put cash in an envelope. They're outside there. Um, so please. Give as God leads you, because the work is never done. It's never finished. Thank you. Amen. Our church, would you stand with us as we continue our worship service this morning? And aren't you glad that God provides us with what we need throughout the day, right? Well, that's, this, that's what this song talks about as well, is how when times look bleak or fearful, that he will give you what you need, and he will make you brave in the when you're facing the storms of life. Amen.
He made a way for all of us to enter into his gates this morning. Amen. When peace like a river When sorrows like sea billows roll, and whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say. Great. 
church, you may be seated. If you're part of Children's Church this morning, if you'll make your way forward and exit either to the right or to the left. And uh, for those that are helping with Children's Church, uh, they will get you where you need to be. So thank you for all that serve in that ministry and those that are a part of that this morning. You guys feel free to come forward. Amen. If everybody will open their Bibles this morning to the book of Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. I'm going to read one verse of scripture to start off with. And we have several scripture that we're going to cover today. Acts 4 starting in verse 12 is the text that I'm going to read. You are welcome to follow along on the YouVersion Bible app if you'd like to. If that's the way you want to do it. We have the partially filled out sermon outline on the back of the worship guide if you want to do that. If you want to sit and listen. Just try not to take a nap. Um, so you see your, your friend nodding off, just uh, give him a little elbow and say, this is important, brother. Or, it's not only brothers who sleep, you know, sisters too. The name Lance is uncommon these days, but in medieval times, people were named Lance a lot. Today, my sermon is about the greatest name that has ever been named. It's the name of Jesus, and we're going to talk about how that name, the name of Jesus, inspired the early church. And so let's read this verse, Acts 4, verse 12, really an awesome verse of scripture. It says these words, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name among heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Father, we love you today. So grateful for the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts and help us to see the significance of your name. And God, your very name had changed the lives of these ordinary fishermen that later would become the apostles and plant churches and spread your message around the world. And yet that same name is saving people's lives today. And I pray that you would do that again. That when we hear the name of Jesus, that we would recognize that it is a sweet, sweet name. But a name we need to pay attention to. A name that beckons us to repent of our sin and place our faith in you. A name that beckons us to surrender and to stop living our lives for ourselves. And so God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint me as I proclaim your word today. And I pray that he would have his way with every heart here in this room we pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that today they would clearly hear the word of God, that they would repent of their sin and declare that there is no one that can save me but Jesus. We love you and pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So we have been talking about first century convictions, that is those things of the early church that got them to do what they did. And Maybe you are thinking about the first century church, and there are a lot of descriptors, adjectives that you might would give to it, and I have some listed up there that they were growing and dynamic and spirit-led. They were culture-changing. They were faithful. They were evangelistic. They were unashamed. They were bold, prayerful, hope-filled, persevering, compassionate, unified, and they were God-fearing. And you might look at that list of descriptions and say, well, that was because they were super Christians. But I want to remind you again that these were ordinary people that simply said yes to Jesus. They simply surrendered to Jesus, and Jesus turned them into all those things. And the church began to grow as they were obedient to him. And so if these things do not describe our church or don't describe your life, the problem isn't God. God can do this to anyone that is willing. Anyone that is a follower of Christ can become these kind of things. But it is about us, whether we are really willing to surrender. The difference between those people who get it and those people who don't get it is simply a matter of conviction. And as we've talked about, what is a conviction? A conviction is a strong and uncompromising belief that shapes our identity and our actions. Christian convictions flow from our relationship with Christ, but they must be consistent with God's word. 
And as we saw, the result of these early church convictions was growth in God's kingdom. And as we as a church become convicted and follow after what Jesus has told us to do, we too will see growth. We have seen that convictions will change culture. Convictions change culture. So far, we've seen that the early church was committed to serve and they were commissioned to go. And then we saw that they were devoted to a lot of things. They were devoted to prayer. They were devoted to the word. They were devoted to fellowship. But today we're going to see that there was one name that was above every name in the heart of those early disciples. And it is the name Jesus. And they were unashamed about the name of Jesus. When I speak of being unashamed, I mean that they didn't hide or cower they didn't deny it. They didn't run and hide every time the, the name Jesus was mentioned, but they claimed it, and they knew that it was the name of Jesus that had changed their lives, and they proudly lived their lives for Jesus. But the question we need to ask today is, what is meant by the name of Jesus? This is the sixth conviction that we are looking at, and when we think of a name, we think of what we call ourselves or what other people call us. You might have a nickname and maybe that's something that's stuck with you when you were a child and you still have it up to today. Maybe you have a name and your parents gave you and you decided at some point you wanted to shorten it or abbreviate it or call yourself something else. So that's generally what we think about when we think about a name. But for the Jews, a name expresses the very nature of of someone's being. All that he is, is his name. And so when we speak of the name of Jesus, we're speaking about his character, his power, and his authority. And when we say that salvation is only in the name of Jesus, it is only because of everything that Jesus is, who he is, his power, his authority, who he is. That is what saves us. And so this name of Jesus is what we're going to look at today. We're going to do something of a survey of the book of Acts, looking at a lot of different passages because the name of Jesus is mentioned over 20 times. And I studied those throughout the week, but I'm not going to mention all of those. We're going to look at a lot of them, but we're going to glean some principles and some truths about the name of Jesus from this survey on the book of Acts. And so let me give you three truths about the name of Jesus. Number one, the first truth is this, that the name of Jesus is powerful. The name of Jesus is powerful. There is no name like the name of Jesus. To begin with, only Jesus can save. In Acts chapter 2, verse 21, it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is only in Christ. And we saw that in Acts 4.12, the passage I read just a moment ago. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is only the name of Jesus. You see, as Christians, we preach an exclusive Christ to an inclusive age. And because of that, we are often accused of being narrow-minded or being intolerant. And the reason is, is because every world religion, with the exception of Christianity, is a system of works that says either you are already good enough or that you can be good enough by working or doing righteous acts. If you go to the temple enough, if you say enough prayers, if you sacrifice enough whatever, then all of a sudden you are made right with God. But the problem with all of this is that it has nothing to do with our sin. And the Bible explains that there is none righteous, no, not one. And that we're all sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. And so all other world religions ignore the fact that we are depraved, we are corrupt, that we are sinners. And that is an important thing to think about. Also, all other world religions leave the solution up to us. Whereas the Bible says there's nothing good in us and that we can't save ourselves by religion or by being good. We needed a savior. And that, folks, is why Jesus came into this world. He came into this world to die on the cross and raise from the dead. That is what Jesus did. His name is a powerful name. Jesus died for us. Mohammed never died for you. Confucius never died for you. All of the Hindu gods, and there are thousands of them, not one of them ever died for you. But Jesus died for you. And whereas all religious founders, they were born... They came up with some kind of philosophy, and then they died. Only Jesus came into this world, 
preached the truth, died on the cross, and now is alive. He defeated the grave. No other religious founder can claim that. The apostles knew that this could not be compromised, which is why you see them saying in verses like verse, chapter 4, verse 12, there's salvation in no other name. Don't be deceived on this. Don't be confused by this. There are many people who say, well, there are many roads to get to heaven. You just have to be sincere. And as long as you try really hard, that is a lie from Satan. There is one way, and his name is Jesus. Only Jesus could redeem us from the slavery of sin. Only Jesus can reconcile us from our separated state with God. Only Jesus can raise us from the dead. Only Jesus makes us new creations. There is no other name but the name of Jesus. And so I want you to think today that when you think about the name of Jesus, I want you to equate that with power. Because no one else could raise you from the dead. No one else can save you except for Jesus. And I've said this before. You don't need to be deceived into thinking, I was really a pretty good person. I think I was 95% righteous and Jesus came in and gave me the other 5%. No, that's not true at all. Even if you were raised in the church, even if you were a good moral person, even if you tried to dot your I's and cross your T's, you never got detention in school. If that's who you are, you are a rule follower. People called you a goody-goody. You still need Jesus. Not because you need that 5%, but because you need 100%. If we're saved, it's not because of anything we've done. Only the name of Jesus can save. But I want you to see also that this powerful name of Jesus speaks to the fact that only Jesus can heal. Only Jesus can heal. In Acts chapter 3 Peter meets this man that is paralyzed, and he says to him, he says, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he got up and he started to jump up and down. He started to dance. He started to shout out, I can walk, I can walk. It's an amazing thing, but it came because of the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 16, verse 18, this speaks of another healing miracle that had taken place in the book of Acts. And it says, And this she kept doing for many days. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Imagine a little girl that had been terrorized by demon possession. It was terrorizing Paul and the missionaries at this point, and Paul called out for that demon to leave, and it left. That is the power of the name of Jesus. These passages show that Jesus is Lord over disease, he's Lord over sickness, he's Lord over demons, he's Lord over everything. And so I want you to know here today, church, that no sickness can attach itself to any cell in our bodies without Jesus knowing about it. Not only does he know about it, he is also the healer. He's also the healer. And even if our sicknesses in this life bring about death, those who are in Christ are ultimately healed. In heaven, there will be a point where we receive a resurrected body that will never experience any sickness. Or as the song said, no pain, no sorrow, no heartache, no sickness comes upon us. In Christ, he is our Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. And it's important for us to remember that every healing miracle in the Bible is meant to glorify God. That's the reason why you see miracles taking place. And as Lord, he is also sovereign. So sometimes he heals on this earth and sometimes he heals in heaven. And so if God says yes to healing you, he is glorified and we need to praise him for that. But if God says no to healing us or healing a loved one, he still deserves to be glorified and we should praise him. So this name of Jesus, I want you to understand here today, it's not some magic incantation like abracadabra and all of a sudden you're going to get healed and we need to have a healing ministry just saying Jesus, Jesus, Jesus and everybody getting healed left and right. That's not what it's all about. And the sons of Sceva found that out the hard way. Have you read this story in Acts chapter 19? Verses 13 through 16, I just listen to this passage. It says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now listen to this. 
So you see what's going on here. They're saying, hey, I can cast out demons just by saying that magic name Jesus. Then you see in verse 14, it says this. Seven sons of a Jewish priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them. Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. The name of Jesus is not some magic formula. We need to understand that. These guys found that out the hard way. But the name of Jesus is powerful. It is a name that saves. It's a name that heals. But it's the name of Jesus also that brings forth change. We try many things to change in our lives. We try behavior modification. If I just stop doing this and just start doing this, I'm going to be okay. But inner transformation can only take place by the name of Jesus. I loved last week when we had the baptism. My my dear brother Jake, when he was baptized, he said, "What, what name do you believe in? And he shouted out, Jesus! That was the name that he shouted out. And it's Jesus that can bring forth change. In Acts chapter 10, verse 48 we see a comment about baptism that is important for us to pay attention to. He commanded them to be baptized. This is Peter commanding the Gentiles. Commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. In Acts 19.5 and some other text as well, you see this phrase, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, or baptized in the name of the Lord. Well, if you compare that to the end of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, Jesus said that we're to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But when you go to Acts, you see that it always speaks about the name of Jesus. So were they being disobedient? What's going on? Why did they use a a different way of saying the baptisms? It's important for us to understand that Jesus was not giving a ritual or a, a sacramental formula The phrase signifies the believer's spiritual union with Christ by faith. And so they're synonymous, whether you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, or the name of Jesus, it's all about the same thing. You're going to be following and identifying with Jesus. You are now a new person. There's a new change that has taken place. When we have a baptism, as I said earlier, it's an outward sign of an inward change. You have a new life because of Jesus. You were dead in your sins, but... Now you walk in newness of life, and the baptism pictures that. And so I want to share with you today, and and I hope that you would consider this. It might have been in your life that there was a point where you had made a profession of faith, or you walked an aisle, and you were baptized. And maybe later on in your life, you discovered that you really were not saved at that point. You didn't understand it. For whatever reason, it was not a genuine salvation. And it might have been during a church service. You might have been home alone reading your Bible. But at some point, you know you had a true, genuine salvation experience where you really repented of your sin. You allowed Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life. And you did not follow in believer's baptism after that point. I want to encourage you to to know this, that baptism is the first step of obedience for a new believer. That day at your house or that day when you were older, when you finally professed Christ, then you need to follow him in believer's baptism. When you were younger, you just got wet. You just had a bath. I don't know how you want to phrase it. It doesn't really matter so much, but what you need to do is follow Jesus in baptism when you know that you were saved. Baptism is that public testimony. These apostles were unashamed because they knew the name of Jesus was powerful. They knew the name of Jesus could save, it could heal, and it's also the name of Jesus that brings about that inner change. But I want to share with you also as we think about this name of Jesus, not only is it powerful, but if you haven't noticed, the name of Jesus is also offensive. The name of Jesus is offensive. There's something about the name of Jesus. Not long ago, Franklin Graham was attacked because he was praying at a political conference and he prayed in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, is what he said. And so some people came on him and said, no, you don't need to pray that name of Jesus. You need to say in God's name or in his name, but don't mention that name of Jesus. They wanted him to compromise. Why did they want him to compromise? Because the name of Jesus could offend people is what he was told. Some people ashamed to speak the name of Jesus might try to have some level of compromise in their lives. But I want to share with you that when you have a conviction that is strong enough, you're going to stop 
compromising and start taking action. You're going to start believing. You're going to start standing up for what you believe in. So what I'm going to share with you are three reasons why the name of Jesus offends people in the book of Acts. To begin with, the name of Jesus convicts hearts. The name of Jesus convicts hearts. About 12, 15 years ago, I was a pastor in Arkansas, and we had a, something of an evangelistic campaign that we were doing. We put up on billboards the name Jesus. It was a green sign with white letters, J-E-S-U-S, capital letters. It's a billboard. You can't miss it. And the idea was is that over time, people we knew would see this billboard, and then we would go to house to house, and we would see people in the marketplace, and we would just make it a topic of conversation. Hey, have you seen that billboard up on that highway? Or, or have you seen the bumper stickers? Have you seen the yard signs? They all were, were the same. They all just said the name Jesus. And it was a way to start a conversation. What do you think about when you think about that name Jesus? And there were some people that said, I love seeing that sign because it reminds me that Jesus is my Lord and Jesus is my Savior. And I just praise him every time I see that sign. But then there were others that said, you know, I'll just be honest with you. I don't like it. Because when I see that sign, it makes me uncomfortable. It reminds me that maybe something isn't right with my life, and I would rather they just take down that sign. You see, the name of Jesus convicts people's hearts. In Acts chapter 5, verse 28, the religious leaders were getting upset at the apostles, and this is what they said to them. We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, this name Jesus, yet here you are, and you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And listen to this phrase. Notice this here. You intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Isn't that interesting? They're over there talking about Jesus being the Savior, Jesus being the risen Lord, and these Sadducees are saying, well, they're trying to make us look like we're guilty. <laughs> they're making it look like we're, we're the ones that are sinners. The name of Jesus convicts hearts. People don't like to be thought of as sinners. They don't want to feel guilty. But here's the thing, until people understand that they are guilty, they're not going to realize that they have a need for a guilt remover. Jesus is not just a, somebody we can call to whenever we have emergencies, somebody we can pray to to make us feel better, somebody we can sing about that will put a smile on our face. Jesus is Lord, he is king, he is boss, he's master, and we need to understand this. And so when we are sick in our sin and dead in our sin, as the Bible explains, we need to turn to him and only he can save us. Only he can change our lives. Oftentimes when I share the gospel with people, you have to convince somebody that they are lost before they come to realize that they need a savior. And nobody here in this church is saved because they come to this church or they dress a certain way or they're from a certain area. We're all sinners who need Jesus and only Jesus can save us. It is his name that convicts hearts, the name of Jesus. But it also offends because his name causes fear. His name causes fear. In 1999, as the Lord was working on my heart, I surrendered to Jesus and I just said, Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go and do whatever you want me to do. And the Lord said, okay, I know you have plans to work all summer and make some money, but instead I'm going to send you to New Hampshire. I said, oh, okay, I'll go. I didn't know anything about New Hampshire. And for the entire summer, I served as a summer missionary in New Hampshire, working especially with youth ministry. And as I was doing this, I think we had got some t-shirts for the youth. And I said, wear these shirts proudly in your school so that people can see that you belong to the church and that you love Jesus. And they raised their hand. And I said, yeah, what's going on? And they said, we can't wear those shirts in this school. Now, keep in mind, this is over 20 years ago. We can't wear these shirts in this school because they say the name Jesus on there. And if I wear that shirt in this school, they're going to tell me to wear it inside out. They were ashamed offended at the school in Acts chapter 4 verses 17 and 18 listen to this text it says but in order that it may spread no further among the people let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus his name causes people to fear Causes people to fear. These religious leaders wanted the apostles to stop saying the name of Jesus. Stop talking about him being resurrected from the dead. Because whenever they would do that, they felt threatened. 
They thought this is going to affect our power. This is going to affect our influence. And really, they just loved their sin and did not want to repent. They wanted to be the one that was Lord over their lives. They didn't want Jesus to be their Lord. And so the name of Jesus is offensive. It convicts hearts and it causes fear. But the name also angers people. It angers people. In Acts chapter 9, verses 28 and 29, what you see is just the escalation of persecution in the book of Acts. At first, it was, guys, stop saying that name Jesus. And then they would get beaten or imprisoned. And then they were starting to kill people that claim the name of Jesus. But in that Acts 9 phrase, it, it speaks about Paul. And Paul was radically saved by Jesus on the road to Damascus. And this is what it says. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed among the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. Isn't it interesting that this man was radically saved by Jesus and was telling people about the hope of Jesus and they were angered by it. They said, I don't want to hear that anymore because they felt guilty for their sin. They were comfortable in their sin. Persecution was escalating, but yet the apostles said, we must obey God rather than men. See, being a Christian is not about self-preservation. It's about Christ exaltation. You have been saved to uplift the name of Jesus. You have been saved to promote the name of Jesus wherever you go. He's the one that saved you. How could we be ashamed of that? You never know how somebody might respond to the message. You might have somebody pray to receive Jesus. You might have somebody that's offended. But we still go and preach boldly in the name of Jesus. If you are somebody that says, I don't want to offend anybody, what about those that would have been saved if you would have shared with them? Those are things that we have to think about. But his name does, in fact, anger people. And so, so far, we're thinking about the name of Jesus, and we see that it's a powerful name, but yet we also see that it offends people. So what are we supposed to do as Christians? We're supposed to realize this third truth about the name of Jesus. It is this, that the name of Jesus is worthy. The name of Jesus is worthy. It's powerful, it does offend, but if we believe in this third truth, it changes everything. The name of Jesus is worthy. And I want to start by saying the name is worth facing our fears. The name of Jesus is worth facing our fears. In Acts chapter 9, verse 27, as Paul was saved, it says, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord and spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. He was bold. He was fearless. He was courageous. He was not ashamed of the name. So I want you to understand here today that the number one reason why people do not share their faith is because of fear. Fear does not come from God. So if you are scared to share your faith, I want you to understand that Satan has a foothold in your heart. He is paralyzing you from being obedient to what Jesus has called you to do. How then do we overcome our fears? And the answer is the same as what happened to the Apostle Paul. Meet with Jesus. See that he is worth it. He's worth getting a little uncomfortable about. He's worth taking a little bit of a risk that somebody could possibly be offended at us sharing the hope of Jesus Christ with them. He is worth it. And here's something else I want everybody to be clear on today. Don't wait till you reach some imaginary spiritual level and say, well, now that I am this close to Jesus, now I'm ready to go on outreach. Now that I'm this close to Jesus, I'm ready to start sharing my faith with my neighbor. Listen to me. That is a really dangerous idea of living because here's what happens. Chances are you are never going to get to that level that you think it is in order to start being obedient. Instead, what we need to recognize is, is that God often uses our going to jumpstart our growing. He uses our going to jumpstart our growing. When you finally surrender and you say, yes, Lord, I'll go, I'll do whatever you want me to do, all of a sudden, not only are you going to be more evangelistic, but here's what might also happen. God might start fixing your anger. God might start fixing your bitterness. 
Whenever you say no, Jesus, you are not just saying no to one area. You're not allowing him to truly be Lord. And you think by going through religious motions that it somehow makes up for it. I am urging you to recognize this truth. That's not really true. God uses our going to jumpstart our growing. Some of you might say, well, I'm just dealing with stuff right now. (laughs) Everybody I'm looking at is dealing with stuff. And here's the thing, people that you see every day are going to be dealing with a lot of stuff if they don't know about Jesus. And I want to encourage you today to stop making excuses and start taking action. How do I do that? It's a conviction. Where does the conviction come from? Meet with Jesus and see that he's worthy. See that he's worth it. So the name of Jesus is worth facing our fears. But secondly, the name of Jesus is worth any amount of suffering, any amount of suffering. We love the word passion, and we throw it around all the time. He's passionate about football. He's passionate about hunting. She's passionate about whatever. She's shopping and and cooking and doing what she does. And and, and we, we, we have passion all the time thrown around. But people think it's about being emotional, being excited about something. But originally, the word passion spoke about being willing to suffer for something. That's what passion means. Are you willing to suffer for that something? And several years ago, there was a movie, many of you have seen The Passion of the Christ, and the whole story was about Jesus dying. And have you ever asked that question, well, what was Jesus passionate about? And there were two things we need to get from that. He's passionate about his glory, but he's also passionate about his people. So why did Jesus go to that cross? Why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus take that torture? He wanted to be glorified, but he also loves you. Do you see that there? That's what drove him to the cross, his glory and his people. What you see in the apostles, they saw the worth of Jesus. In Acts chapter 5, this is such an amazing text, verses 40 through 42. I have just one verse up there, but I'll give you a little more of the context. Verse 40, when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Notice how they respond to this beating. They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. In Acts chapter 15, verses 25 and 26, the Jerusalem council was talking about Barnabas and Paul. And it says this, that they are men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 21, verse 13, Paul answers, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, when you read those texts, what is your response to that? These guys are radical. These guys are super Christians, ready to give their life for Jesus. But I want you to understand here today that that is the call of everyone that's saved. We are no longer our own. And it doesn't mean that we're all going to be martyrs, but we all need to be able to be willing to give our lives to whatever Jesus wants us to do. So why would anyone then go through that type of persecution for the name of Jesus? And I think it is because they know the worth of the name of Jesus. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, here's the worth of Jesus. Now, if you can read this and just shrug your shoulder and say, eh, it's no big deal, then you got some darkness in your heart, brother or sister. Verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When you see the greatness of the name of Jesus, you can't live your life like you always have before. There is a change that takes place. There is a passion that rises in your heart. Everything is different when you see how glorious the name of Jesus is. How can you see how glorious the name of Jesus is and then step away and say, yeah, but I don't want to tell my family member. Yeah, but I don't want to tell my friend. Yeah, I don't want to tell that person. When you see the greatness of the name, it finally clicks that your life 
is not about you. We're his. And the only response, the only response that we can give to something like that, those verses, every name, that means every single person in this room without exception is going to bow down at the name of Jesus, at the feet of Jesus. Do you see that there? I'm not making this stuff up there. That's what Jesus is. That's who he is. That's his worth, right? This is how majestic that great, powerful, awesome, and yet offensive name is. That's the name of Jesus. How do we respond to that? The only response is surrender. That's the only response that we can possibly have. So my question to you, church, is this. What are you holding on to that is greater than the name of Jesus? What are you holding on to that's greater than than the name of Jesus. There might have been times in your life where you knew the Holy Spirit was pressing you to repent, to surrender, and you had something and you would not let go. Every now and then I, I look at the pews and I, I see the, the white palms and, and you, can, you, can, you can see that someone was clenching on them. You know the Holy Spirit's moving, but they refuse to let go. They refuse to surrender because they have something in their mind. And my question to you is, whatever that something is that pops up in your mind, that grudge, that, that bitterness, whatever it is, that, that addiction, that sin, whatever it is, is it worth more than the name of Jesus? So how do we surrender? And I have three words up there, and maybe I would even add a fourth word since I wrote that. But to surrender means that I'm yours, Jesus. I'm yours. Whenever, wherever, however, whatever. I am yours, Jesus. I belong to you. So the call today is to surrender to the name of Jesus. You might say I'm just an ordinary, common person from Hoax Bluff, Alabama. What does it matter? Here's why it matters. He's worth it. And you have been created to make much of his name. So the call today is to surrender to Jesus. His name is powerful. It is offensive. But listen to me, church. It is completely worth it. At this time, I want to invite our musicians to come forward and counselors can come over here to the doors. We've spoken about the name of Jesus today. And how do you respond to that name, the name that's above every name? And that includes your own name. And some of us have exalted our own name more than we've exalted the name of Jesus. And God's calling us today to step away from that, to repent, to turn from that. These altars are going to be open for you to come and just get real with Jesus, to stop pretending, to stop going through motions. So what does it take to stop being ashamed of the name of Jesus? It takes surrender. When you meet with Jesus and see how glorious he is, how majestic his name is, how can you return to life like normal? How can you say, eh, I'd rather do this. I'd rather be that way. The only response is surrender. Some of you may need to be saved. The name of Jesus is the only way that you can be saved. You might think you're a good person, and, and maybe in other people's eyes, you are a good person. Maybe you're a good husband, a good wife, a good mother, a good father, a good worker, and you try really hard with your life. And I want you to understand here today that there is a sickness that has invaded your heart, and it is sin. And that sin is eventually going to take your life and separate you for eternity from God. But Jesus is the cure. The name of Jesus is the only name that can save you. And so today, you can repent of your sins, place your faith in Christ, and you will have a personal relationship with him where he will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding, where you can know that you know that you belong to him. You know that you're going to be a child of God. You know that if something happened to you today on the way home from church, that you will stand before Jesus and say, I don't deserve to get into heaven, but by your grace, by the blood of Jesus on the cross, I know that I'm yours. Do you want that type of assurance? You can by coming today, and I'd be glad to share with you how you can receive Jesus. As we have a time of response, I want to invite you to come to him. You might have a question about baptism, or how can you know that you're saved, or maybe you have a question about church membership. You're welcome to come as we have this time of response, but these altars are also open. Some of you are struggling with a burden right now, 
Jesus loves you, and he tells us that we can cast our cares on him because he cares for us. And here's what's going to happen. If you come and you bow down before the Lord Jesus at this altar, we'll have a brother or sister come to you and just lay your, their hand on your shoulder and say, I'm with you and I'm praying for you as well. And so if that's you here today, that's why we need to come. We're having a time of response. The name of Jesus, it is a glorious name. Are you willing to surrender? Let's all stand together, and as Jeff has this song playing and the praise band is playing, come to Jesus, surrender. His name is above every name. In my mother's womb me with your hands known and loved by you before I took a breath when I doubt the Lord remind me that I'm wonderfully made you're an artist and a part I'm the canvas and the clay and you make all things work together for my future and for my good you make all things work together for your glory and for your name I'm the canvas and the clay, and I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. Oh, cause you're an artist and a part of, I'm the canvas and the clay. Who 
work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name. Praise God. And I, I just want to remind you, you don't have to be in a church service to get right with the Lord, to do business with him. And so uh, if, if the Lord leads you to meet with someone after church, that's perfectly fine. If you need to uh, meet with me sometime during the week, I'd be glad to, to have those conversations. And so God bless you for that. Just a few uh, words of announcement as we are going to get dismissed here in just a moment. Uh, our new member is going to be Miss Sadie after getting baptized, and so if you rejoice in that, would you say amen? Amen. Praise God. Just a, a few other words. Uh, don't forget that uh, our, our myers Mallory State Missions offering is going on through the month of September. All of that good stuff there in the, in the worship guide tells you what it's all about. Evangelism training is going on every single Sunday during September. If you're interested in that, you can see me or our brother Randy Cortez. Randy, will you wave at everybody? There he is. If you're interested in being a part of evangelism training, we would be glad to help you to learn. So we have no excuse to say, well, I've never been trained. Well, we're trying to give you an opportunity to be trained. And so be faithful to that. God will certainly bless you for that. Also, uh, don't forget tonight, there is no o adult OCD and no youth Bible study uh, for a Sunday night. We do have Celebrate Recovery, Senior Adult Bible Study will also be on tonight as well. Anyone else have a word of announcement that needs to be shared? Yes, ma'am. Certainly glad to see Ada. God is good. Amen. All right. Is there another word? All right. Well, God bless you all for being here. It's been a good Sunday. Let's all stand together, and Jeff and the Praise Band is going to lead us out in a song. God bless you for being here. Have a great day.